Good morning to all of you. Thank you for joining today's webinar, How Have Teachers at Stockholm University Adapted Their Lectures During COVID-19 Using Its Learning? Today, we will hear about the challenges and lessons learned from a rapid transition to 100% online learning at Stockholm University. Also, we will learn what has worked best for two different departments at Stockholm University using its learning, and what are some of the approaches moving forward. Before I hand over the microphone, I will just quickly share the agenda. So we're gonna hear a little about the speakers and their presentation. Later, we will have a QA and a session. And just as a reminder, all attendees are muted today. But if you have any questions, there is a button in the control panel with the question mark. It's in the right hand of the screen. Write your questions there and we will address them during this, the Q&A. Finally, we will share some links. Now I would just welcome our guest speakers. Okay, so welcome uh, Christina Storr, lecturer and doctoral candidate in law and informatics at the Department of Law and Nicholas Jans, Professor in Evolutionary Insect Ecology and Head of the Ecology, Ecology Division at the Department of Zoology. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank Great you very much. Um, so as, as um, my chair already said, um, my name is Christine and I'm, I've been teaching at the Law Department uh, for quite a few years uh, and I also have a role as a coordinator for IT pedagogy. So the perspective um, we're going to be having today is, is from two uh, sides. Right, and I'm in a similar position at uh, my department, uh, uh, working both with actual teaching with, and, and with some uh, teaching coordination. Uh, I've also been working for a long time as a teacher here, since 94, actually. Uh, but the difference between us the main difference is that we have the very different sizes of our classes usually. So while Christina has um, several hundred of people in the classes normally, for us it's usually uh, le very rarely more than 50 and often 10 to 15 students. That of course makes a difference in the kinds of approaches that we can make, can take. So uh, to start off this, uh, a little bit of background information. We, as, as many others, we were struck by this uh, Corona situation in March 2020. And uh, then Stockholm University made the decision to move uh, to 100% to online teaching. And we had to do this transition within a week. So it was quite a challenging situation, of course. I should say also that for us at Stockholm University, something that is a little bit unusual perhaps is that students usually take the courses in full-time blocks. So they do one course at a time. And usually we are, uh, the courses are divided in this, so that it is, uh, there are two courses each semester. Uh, and this uh, date in March coincided with the end of the first module in the spring semester. So those who were in that module had to quickly scramble to uh, transfer their exams to an online uh, form, which was very difficult for, for many of the courses. And the second module courses, of course, had to instead move everything online uh, and prepare for that kind of, of uh, online teaching. And uh, could perhaps also say that uh, at this very moment, the university had just completed the move to its learning as a learning platform. I think the last, the, the old aging platform that we used before was that basically closed down in February 2020. So for many teachers, this was a new, uh, a new experience. Um, and and is it in in our roles as as coordinators we've got a lot of questions because teachers suddenly had to both create digital content for the courses that were starting um the law department hadn't actually moved into its learning yet so uh, a few courses were planning for autumn so they hadn't actually really um built any courses in its learning so they had to set that up within a week or a few days in addition then as well create assignments 
Um, and one of the main challenges, especially with the law department, were the, were the exams, as Nicholas mentioned, because there were a lot of exams going on or about to go on. Um, and that meant, uh, as far as I know, even the Stockno Stockholm Business School, for example, they had used paper exams on campus previously and had within a few days to move to a digital exam with around 900 students without, without ever having used the tool before. So there was quite a lot of um, sudden changes that and where people had to start from scratch, basically. Right. And uh, of course, on the other hand, uh, it was also very evident that courses that had started to use uh, its learning uh, and also use other tools like video extensively and uh, and also implemented these uh, available tools for communication and perhaps especially using alternative forms of examination such as assignments or home exams etc. Uh, these courses didn't have to change much at all and it was much easier for them to to do the transition. So I think that even if it was challenging for uh, many teachers to make the transition, of course, I think that we were still lucky in that we had just implemented its learning across the board at this time, because if we hadn't, I think we would have been in much more trouble. But still, there were challenges, right? Uh, a few. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we, Nicholas and me kind of picked out a few partly as well because we maybe found solutions for these things so there were definitely more challenges um, but I think the first challenge we both noticed was the, of course the teachers have varying technical backgrounds some are very familiar and as Nicholas mentioned had already implemented quite a few things in its learning uh, others didn't have a course there and didn't have any material either so they both had to look to learn the tools for um, to have online classes or to start recording online classes um, and start to use its learning. Um, and something I think we come back to as well during the, the presentation as well is that the combination of pedagogy and IT tools was very crucial. Um, and I think without having um, tools in place already, so even if the courses haven't started using it, but its learning was in place. Uh, so it's still, I don't think we would have managed actually without any any tools as such. So they still made it possible at least to to continue teaching in a, a certain, in, in a somewhat uh, okay manner. Hmm. Yeah, and, and that, so that is a very general uh, type of challenge that was, uh, that everyone more or less were experiencing. But we also had some very specific issues at our department because we have a lot of lab intensive courses and also um, field courses. And of course, these were not possible to do. Um, myself, I haven't been that much involved in, in the lab intensive courses, but I've understood that um, this was a real problem. In some cases, you, you could uh, change these to um, online demonstrations or videos, but uh, it is this hands-on experience of actually doing something in the lab. It's, it's a very important aspect and it's very difficult to, to emulate. Um, what I did myself was that I had an ecology course with a, a integrated field course. And uh, of course that was also an issue. Normally the students go up out to a field station that we have and uh, they work in groups there uh, proje on projects for about eight days and uh, they produce like a report, a scientific report out of this in the end. Um, so now this is also in the syllabus so we cannot just easily skip it. It's something that students are supposed to learn to do. So we thought a lot about how to uh, do this and we ended up uh, with a solution where students were divided into virtual groups uh, working in their home environment, uh, counting, measuring things around their houses, uh, but, but still staying in touch with, within the group, comparing the data 
collecting data, analyzing the data, and eventually also collaborate in the writing. So here is also a situation where uh, the digital tools was uh, uh, enabling us to do this. It would have been very difficult uh, without that. And it turned out surprisingly well. Uh, of course, there were things that they missed out on, but the students were in general very uh, happy about this. And we thought as teachers also that they, uh, it worked better than we uh, thought, actually. Um, and then, of course, the next thing here on the list is exams. And I, as we have mentioned several times, that was probably one of the most difficult uh, challenges to to meet and especially then for the courses that uh, were using the traditional uh, end of course large or campus exams uh, and there were some attempts to solve this by using video supervised exams for example but uh, none of those solutions were ideal um, but I think if you change the slide there um, what we uh, can do, and, th and this is an example that I have from one of my courses this spring, is that uh, you could uh, simply skip the, the exam and have a series of assignments um, and uh, other activities that you grade throughout the course instead. And, and in this particular course, we had already implemented that and we, we used this continuous examination throughout. And I chose this image. This is the planner from the course. And uh, this was a course that was running on part time. So it was running throughout the whole semester. And circled in red there is the date when Corona struck. And uh, the only thing that changed in the planner from that date was that we had added some Zoom links that you might be able to see uh, on the seminars following that date. Uh, apart from that, everything could stay exactly the same. So we really, we really didn't have to change much, uh, which was, of course, uh, very nice. And uh, I think that um, this is something that can be implemented in many other courses as well. And uh, Another advantage of doing this, of course, is that it takes some pressure off the students and towards the end of the course, and you also encourage them to actually start working with the material early on. So I think it has pedagogical advantages as well. Mm. Although it might not be possible to do in all courses, I suppose. No, and, and there I've noticed that the, the law department traditionally we we have we maybe have one written assignment throughout the course, but we uh, there's a lot there's a, a large focus on the on the last exam, um, and there again I, I think it's really interesting to see this combination of pedagogy and and, I, and technical tools um, because of course now it's a lot easier as well to have continuous assignments. Um, uh, previously, if, if you don't have a good learning management platform, it's a bit more difficult to actually have have it see to, to, for the students to cooperate and to. Uh, but there, I really noticed the challenge for us, especially as well, because the, we have a lot of campus exams as well, where you're supposed to be in class, and the questions you ask when somebody's in class, supervised as opposed to them sitting at home, are quite different. Um, so there, I noticed that. Um, and, but because that's not in place, uh, that wasn't possible either for us to, to introduce. But I really hope that maybe because of some of the innovations as well we, we are already discussing, maybe that's actually the change that's going to happen. To have more continuous examination instead of one final exam. Both from the student's perspective but as well from the teacher's perspective. Mm -hmm. um, but of course it's a question of resources as well, um, which I think we come back to a bit as well. Um, another issue that, that both Niklas and me faced was the, the contact and, and communication with the students. Uh, so even if I tend to have either lectures between 150 and 300 students and maybe seminars with 30, I, I usually don't, unfortunately, I don't kind of get to know the students personally. Um, so, for, but for me, it was more that 
after lectures and the breaks, the students would come up and would ask questions. Um, and that's, of course, not possible when you have an online webinar and online lecture because the students don't feel because if they ask a question, everybody can hear the question. Um, and I had already previously implemented, um, mainly because I'm not such a fan of email. <laughs> Um, I had already previously implemented a discussion forum for my courses um, where students could ask questions about the course and then either I answer or maybe another student answers. Um, and that there are really, and that tool haven't been used that much the previous years and I've maybe used that now two years. Um, but there I really noticed an increase now that students suddenly were asking these kind of these quick questions you ask the teacher after class. Um, they posted those on the discussion forum. Um, and I think some of them really showed me as well, then, of course, more collected, what are the types of questions students usually have. Um, so my plan is always then to reuse those questions in the next term and, and have them as a sort of uh, frequently asked questions where I already post uh, the answer. So that I thought was a very useful tool to kind of supplement at least the, the lack of, of direct contact. Right, and I think uh, this is, you know, to some extent, it was perhaps even a larger uh, change for us, where we are used to really uh, get to know the students, you know, because there are so few, and the students are used to getting to know the teachers. Uh, so this relationship between student and teacher is, is, a, is an important part of our pedagogics, I should say, even. And uh, so I think this is a great idea for, for also smaller courses to have. Um, and what we also tried to do was to have uh, regular meetups on, on video and Zoom outside of the schedule where students and teachers could meet up and, and uh, chat a bit more informally, which was also uh, appreciated. Um, one particular challenge that I guess in this case now I faced was um, the law education is very much quite often we have attendance requirements. Um, it's basically a formal way of saying okay the students was in class. It's, it usually doesn't involve more than that. Um, that's fairly easy in a classroom. You either tick the students off in the break or you um, call out their names. Um, but I noticed after my first lecture where I had to take attendance that that was a very cumbersome process. Um, it took me a lot longer online because I needed, I wanted to see the students on camera. Um, I tested as well to have the logs from the online lecture afterwards. That took a lot of time as well. And what I had already started was to actually keep track of the attendance in its learning. Um, so there I had the idea after being fed up basically after sitting with um, quite not very challenging task for quite a few minutes, I realized, but what if I just ask the students quite simple questions? So the ones you see now are in Swedish, but they are very simple questions where the students have to search for something I've showed them in class um, and make them hand in the, um, the, the attendance basically as a, an, an assignment instead of just ticking off their attendance. Um, and I realized this worked really well for me because I guess be just because we've traditionally been using attendance, I hadn't actually realized that that doesn't show me if the students understood anything of the things I took up in class or not. It, it usually is enough if they ask one question. Um, so there I realized that actually had a, a really high pedagogical value for me because I saw that most of them actually got <laughs> the ideas and the skills I was trying to uh, convey in class. Um, what we come back to later is that I identified a few other challenges with this. <laughs> because it, it took me a quite a long time to go through the answers. Uh, so we come back to that. But I realized this was, for me, actually a very useful thing um, to see in and then see it collected in its learning as well. Okay, these are the challenges students have more often than others. Hmm. So I think that uh, it's worth noting then also that this is something that can be useful even in smaller classes where attendance as such is not really an issue because you see who's there very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. But uh, it can be very useful just as a way to check that students have uh, understood what they have picked up and, uh, and even as a motivation to actually work with the material and uh, pay attention. 
So I think we can, we, we could implement something similar as well. And I guess that comes back to as well, this continuous examination, which we yeah. don't have in the same way as, as you do. I think there's really, again, the pedagogy actually would be better from more the, the um, continuous uh, examination and, and tasks instead of just having one final um, task and assignment. Right. Okay, so then to round this up, we we uh, wanted to say a little bit about where we stand and where we are going at the moment. For the current directive that we have from the university now in, in Stockholm is uh, to use blended learning. That is uh, a combination of campus and online teaching. As long as we uh, maintain physical distance and all those other regulations, uh, we are allowed to be on campus now with the students if it is deemed necessary for pedagogical reasons. And of course, this solves some of our bigger problems with the uh, lab and field courses. Uh, we are very relieved that we can now actually do them in a more normal way. Um, it is uh, so the next thing there is is the that we also think now that uh, well, we are already starting to see that the students' expectations are starting to change when it comes to online teaching. We, most or all teachers I've talked to uh, from the spring uh, said that the students were in fact very understanding and uh, uh, when it comes to understanding that uh, the, the difficult situation that the teachers were put in. So, uh, but this might not remain forever, and uh, mm -hmm. it will probably be the case that students, after a while, will start to demand more. And you cannot get away with just uh, making Zoom lectures for hours and hours. Uh, so we need to change the way that we approach teaching uh, to, to better suit an online format. And, and one of the good things that came out of the whole situation was, I think, that I had to rethink a bit my teaching and actually found ways that I'm going to continue using now. Um, so probably without being forced to taking attendance, I wouldn't, for example, have noticed, oh, but having the students um, uh, submit assignments is, is actually a better way for me to, to check their understanding. Um, what I have noticed though as well is that to go through that took me a quite a lot of time. So I'm going to develop the idea now further and, and add peer review. So the students then give feedback to each other about um, their skills. So, and even there to make it more interactive, because I guess one of the things we notice now is when students are at home more, a lot more themselves, I think it's as well good to give them more interactive um, tasks. So. Um, they as well have more contact, a bit like you mentioned with the field studies, so to still keep the, the contact between the students as well. Um, so, so there I definitely see an, an, an something good <laughs> coming out of it too, um, that I will continue developing. And I think, I'm sure a lot of others too. Yes, and I think that is uh, clearly a positive side, eff side effect from this uh, difficult situation that we will see uh, an increased adoption of digital tools and pedagogical methods uh, in, and alternative ways of examination. And I think that will work to strengthen the learning environment in general for us and for the students. Uh, so then to round this up in the end, um, we just wanted to say that, uh, well, first of all, I think this, this experience has uh, opened our collective eyes to the possibilities of online teaching and I, I sense a lot of enthusiasm around it now. Uh, we're lucky to have tools in place. We were lucky to have these tools in place that allowed us to, to make this transition as well as we, we did. Uh, uh, I mean, some courses have even said now that uh, some course leaders that they are uh, prepared to move their courses to an online format, even without having these restrictions in place, which is in interesting. 
I think. Um, but even so, I think we would like to end with saying that in this general enthusiasm over online teaching, we should not forget that the pedagogical value of having in life meetings, real life meetings as well, between teachers and students and among students. And certainly, uh, I really miss the opportunity of interacting with students in real life. And uh, I think as soon as we can, we should remember that this is also an important part of, of teaching. And I think with that, the time is up and uh, I think mm -hmm. we're done with this. Mm -hmm. And we're happy to take questions and see if we can answer mm -hmm. any of them. All right. Well, thank you again, uh, Christine and Niklas, for your presentation. Uh, and thanks again for joining us today. Let's see if there's any questions here. And I see, uh, how has the sudden forced adoption of technology delivered instruction affected the well-being of professors and students? Right. Uh, that's a very good question. I think it is, uh, it is a, a rising concern that uh, well, the workload has clearly been increased for the teachers. Uh, and we have also noticed that the students are uh, having issues with uh, um, both physical pain, but, but also psychologically suffering from being constrained and, and uh, re restrained in their homes. So this is something we will have to keep an eye on. And, and I think there's a larger awareness. I think in, in spring we were basically just trying to get through and I think most people were hoping it would be better in, in autumn. But I think now I've noticed, I think there is going to be a larger awareness as well of these challenges. So maybe now the focus will be more on the more psychological effects and less on the um, kind of how do we solve this kind of purely from a technical perspective. Right. And the next question is, will some of your lessons learn uh, change on site teaching? Um, for, for me, they're actually definitely gonna. Uh, so, even if at some point uh, we just decided the law department will also in autumn be purely online, 80% uh, of the classes. Um, so, I will definitely continue using more assignments and a bit like Niklas already is doing for his courses um, to have more continuous and even if it's just small assignments that the students hand in but instead of this just more formal requirements um, for, for attendance. So um, I, I will definitely continue using more of these small nuggets continuously during the course, also to keep the students a bit more involved, um, not just with me, but also with each other. Yes, and I think that it's something that we also, many of us have seen is that we, we realize that some of the things that we've done worked very well uh, online. And, and so why not keep them like that? Well, and then we can focus on, on, on the things that really make sense to have on site. Because I think also that, that this situation that we have now will not go away overnight. It will, to some extent, remain for a long time. So we have to be prepared for this blended teaching situation uh, for a foreseeable future. Right. All right. Well, thank you, thank you all for your questions. Uh, if we couldn't address them all today for any time matters, we will still give you an answer on your email address after this session. So I'm just finally going to share some links uh, with more information about its learning. And there, yeah, thanks. And uh, some resources about remote learning. And uh, I'm also going to share you the links to the product development uh, roadmap. Uh, I'm going to include also some uh, some links about the about the back to school season for this new semester, and also don't forget to follow us on social media, LinkedIn and Twitter, because we're going to share some news soon, and uh, we're also going to share the links to the next webinar. So thank you again, Christine and Niklas, and all all of you for joining today. So have a nice day. Thank you. Our pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.